the exhibition opened last night. It's on. Um, you're welcome to visit uh, anytime you find during those days and also give us feedback uh, if you wish. So um, without further ado, I, I will uh, offer a few contextual points uh, that will hopefully also set the tone for today's uh, discussion and talks. Nine drawing, artist moved to despair, shows a male figure at the bottom of two gigantic sculptural fragments, posited on what looks like both a tombstone and a pedestal. The artist's resigned posture makes it look like as if he has been thrown on a similar tombstone. He sits with one hand on his head and the other on the sculptural fragment of a foot and his gaze hidden from the viewer. The artist is overwhelmed by the material presence of the past that these oversized fragments embody. From closing the possibility to piece together the fragments to reconstruct the lost hole, the big foot and the half-open hand with a pointing finger directed upward hinted the notion of the past as one that is irretrievably lost. In the abyss of this loss, the exaggerated fragments come to supplement the unattainable hole and yet point at an uncertain future. Buried yet alive, inanimate yet spectral, these fragments blind the artist who is neither able to face the viewer, the future to come, nor to look at the fragments themselves, to see the past. <coughs> Cut up in the melancholy of the present, between an impossible past and an uncertain future, the artist is driven to despair because he is yet unable to realize that the fragments contain hope and that hope is called history. Yet, despite the despair they cause, the way Fuseli has incorporated fragments from classical antiquity revealed a desire to attain an ideal. And it is this ideal that hunts the allegorical presence of the fragments. fragments. Fuseli, after all, was one of the first translators of Winkelmann and specifically of his reflections on the painting and sculpture of the Greek <coughs> as early as 1765. I read this drawing as one that captures the advent of historical consciousness when history is felt as a presence of an ideal captured in the material that bears the marks of time. Of time. Yet, the consciousness of historical realization is in a nascent state. Less than a year later, history in its modern sense would sweep Europe as the French Revolution violently overthrew, overthrew the ancien regime and its representations. And it was also built on this classical antiquity that the uh, ideal of the revolution was uh, constructed. Historical consciousness arriving with guillotine was what allowed the moderns to face the fragment as a historical artifact and thus unburden oneself even if momentarily from its material weight. And it is this consciousness that a little less than 200 years later allowed Sai Twombly to stare straight at the fragment of the pointed finger of the Emperor Constantine and be photographed by Robert Rauschenberg, uh, this is the same fragment that Fuseli drew, drew uh, 200 years ago. <coughs> Any effort to think time is, an, is necessarily a historical endeavor, one that is an act of making the abstract concrete, of encapsulating something that is immensely vast, variable and fluid, and of pinning down that which constantly escapes us, yet what is formative for life itself. Historical documents, material objects, works of art, the entire material body of the civilization that Marx calls man's inorganic body is a capsule that not only carries the memory of the past efforts to render the abstract concrete, but also unfolds in the future as a promise. Then what does it mean to think time today? Perhaps it does not only or not as much mean to make time an object of thought, but to make time for thought, for thinking. Thinking time and the time of thinking is perhaps what can point the way out of the world historical notion of contemporaneity, dominating today as what Peter Osborne calls a permanent seeking, seeming aftermath. And we offer the possibility for re realizing historical consciousness. Ultimately, we seem to have arrived to the conditions of Fuseli's artist, 
that in the so-called post-historical moment of the contemporary that has falsely sublated the ideal buried in the fragment into so many fetishisms of fragments and fragments of fetishism. The propositions, philosophical, historical, art historical, curatorial, that we will hear today in this room and also tomorrow, um, will surely complicate our notions of time and yet it is through this complexity that we might be able to capture and understand our world today, one with immense contradictions and incongruities. What the papers propose is that to think time and the time of thinking makes oneself out of joint with time, or rather with the notions of temporality that dominate a particular epoch and, and our epoch as well. I hope the temporality of this conference will precisely uh, be this time at odds with this itself and perhaps uh, by, to that extent it's uh, also anachronistic. And I want to thank uh, everyone who uh, uh, came today to, to join us as speakers, as uh, participants, as, as, as audience members and everyone who helped to put the conference together. Uh, the uh, Arts and Humanities Initiative, the Department of, Department of Fine Arts and Art History, uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Dean's Office, as well as uh, everyone who worked on the conference, and especially Shirin, who, who did a lot of work these days. And I'll give the floor to, to Ray Brassier, our uh, keynote speaker today, who is engaging with Jameson's work and his paper is entitled Absolute History. So, uh, first of all, thanks, Tanya, for inviting me. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to basically the focus of my paper is going to be um, Frederick Jameson's uh, long essay called The Valences of History, uh, which appeared at the concluding chapter of his 2009 <coughs> book, uh, Valences of the Dialectic. Uh, the reason you know, I'm talking, I want to just basically kind of uh, present or kind of give a, an elaboration uh, of Jameson's work is because I think it's, you know, it's, it's really extraordinary and I'm not aware of, or at least I haven't come across uh, many uh, detailed discussions of it. So um, the paper is going to have uh, three parts, uh, a brief kind of uh, preliminary, uh, intro preliminary section which I'll introduce in the methodological problems about thinking about time. Then uh, a discussion of Bergson's attempt to think time as in terms of lived experience or duration. And finally, then I'll move on to the, uh, an elaboration of, uh, of Jameson's intervention, the way in which I think Jameson um, you know, carries out this, I think, you know, pretty extraordinary kind of reconfiguration of the problem of thinking time. Okay. So, um, yes, I've also got... Uh, yeah, no, no, yes, uh, just, yeah, there's a, uh, the relevant quotes will be on the, uh, on the PowerPoint, okay? So, the attempt, first, the methodological problem. So, the attempt to think time poses a methodological problem because time is no ordinary or object or phenomenon. So, the philosophical theorizing of time is split between the metaphysical and the phenomenological approach. Metaphysics asks, what is time? Phenomenology asks, how do we experience time? Aristotle is perhaps a paradigmatic example of the metaphysical approach. Despite or perhaps because of it, he construes time as a physical phenomenon. Time, according to his famous definition, is the number of motion with respect to the before and after. Um, so time is defined in terms of the more fundamental notions of number, motion and sequence, or what he calls before and after. Now it's often objected that before and after is a temporal distinction, so that Aristotle's definition begs the question, but actually, um, before and after can be taken to be earlier than and later than, and these are determinations of order that, um, that apply to synchronic structures, so that the notion of a temporal sequencing is perfectly intelligible. In a numerical sequence, earlier than and later than are determinations, are fixed determinations of position. Okay, and they imply no uh, chronology at all. Uh, so it's not, I think it's not true that Aristotle's definition is so. 
Still, the metaphysical approach faces two problems. What data are we to take as preeminently temporal? Are they to be physical, biological, historical, or psychological? If time is the number of motion, does this mean that motionlessness is equivalent to timelessness? But surely, motionless itself is conceived as a state during which time passes. Does this then mean that time's passing is irreducible to objective measure? If we cannot determine which data qual qualifies intrinsically temporal, then we cannot determine which phenomenon should provide the starting point for our metaphysical investigation into the nature of time. And moreover, if metaphysics, if metaphysics begins by asking what kind of thing time is, this investigation may misfire from the start precisely insofar as time cannot be conceived as any kind of thing. It resists reification. But the most common objection to the objective definition of time is that it cannot adequately account for our experience of the passing of time, a phenomenon that seems to be independent of every objective measure. And this difficulty is famously formulated by Augustine. Um, uh, this is the famous uh, passage from Augustine's Confe uh, Confessions, Book 11 of Time and Eternity. So Augustine asks, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asks, I know not. Yet I say boldly that I know that if nothing passed away, time passed were not. And if nothing were coming, a time to come were not. And if nothing were, time present were not. Those two times then, past and to come, how are they, seeing the past now is not, and that to come is not yet? But the present, should it always be present and never pass into time past, verily it should not be time but eternity. If time present, if it is to be time, only comes into existence because it passes into time past, how can we say that either this is, whose cause of being is, that it shall not be? So namely, that we cannot truly say that time is, but because it is tending not to be. So this famous kind of uh, discussion by Augustine, and, you know, it points out the, anom the, the ontologically anomalous status of the <coughs> phenomenon of time. If we think of the present as what is, its positive consistency is riven by two negations, both of which are internal to it. The present that is not yet, and the present that it has been. So the consistency of the actual present is punctured by both these absent presences, on which it turns out to be dependent. Thus, Augustine was driven to think what is not yet and what has been as constitutive of what is actually present, such that the present exists as the distension encompassing the anticipation of what is not yet, as well as the retention of what is no longer. The distended present of consciousness exists as the differential articulation of past and future presence. And this is, of course, a view that anticipates a Searle's account of the living present as structured by the interplay of retention and potential, as well as Heidegger's account of ecstatic temporality and being in time. Taking this distinction as its starting point, the phenomenological approach is more sensitive to the danger of reifying time. But it faces one fundamental problem, and to see this problem, we have, we have to distinguish three registers of time. Um, the, uh, yeah, this, the three registers of time. A subjective register, where time is individual experience, which is phenomenologically or existentially characterized. A historical dimension, time is collective experience, which encompasses, which encompasses political, institutional, and archaeological dimensions. And finally, time as objective, time as impersonal and non-experiential. And this is time as a physical, biological, <coughs> geological, or cosmological phenomenon. Now, the articulation of these three registers presents a problem for 
the phenomenological as well as the metaphysical approach. If the subjective experience of time is our fundamental data, how do we go about reconnecting <coughs> it to historical and cosmological time? Can phenomenology avoid subjectivizing time? The, subjective, the subjectivization of time internalizes it to individual consciousness. So time's irreducibility is maintained at the cost of affirming the absolute primacy of subjectivity. And this is, of course, the mood made by Bergson, Husserl, and Heidegger, each in, a, in their different ways. But it only attains full methodological self-consciousness in Heidegger for whom existential temporality is a source of and condition for historical and cosmological time. Two problems then arise. First, how can the plurality of subjective times be rendered commensurate within a single impersonal historical time? Second, how can the boundary between personal and impersonal, experiential and non-experiential, be wholly inscribed within subjective time. We will return to these issues below. The important thing to note for now is how metaphysics and phenomenology conspire to sandwich history between subjective and objective time. And it's this sandwiching of history that Jameson will challenge in his paper. So, now we move on to um, the next section. So, Kant lends the methodological problem a decisive twist. Famous that time yields no shape, according to Kant's famous dictum in the Critique of Pure Reason. For Kant, it's precisely because time is a form of intuition that it is devoid of conceptual form. In Platonic terms, time is formlessness as such. So the problem of conceptualizing time is that of trying to give form to formlessness as such. Of course, formlessness as such is a paradoxical notion. And this is why every attempt to formalize time is paradoxical. And it's also why time is a phenomenon that resists conceptual representation. Or conceptualization, if one equates conceptualization with representation. Does this then mean it can only be grasped as pure presentation? Here it's important to mark the difference between the Kantian claim that time as form of intuition is a necessary condition for the representability or cognizability of objects and the claim that time is intuitive formlessness. The claim that formlessness as such can be directly intuitive is the temptation proper to any philosophy that thinks it can circumvent representation by retrieving the immediacy of time's self-presentation in terms of so-called lived experience. Bergson is the preeminent advocate of this claim. It requires separating time from space. Space is quantity without quality, or repetition, partes, extra partes. Time is quality devoid of any unit of measure, and hence quality without quantity. This is the first quote from Bergson's from Time and Free Will. In a word, pure duration um, might well be nothing but a succession of qualitative changes which melt into and permeate one another without precise outlines, without any tendency to externalize themselves in relation to one another, without any affiliation with number. It would be pure heterogeneity. In Bergson's account, the heterogeneity of duration cannot be aligned with a difference in extensity or space because it is sensed and not thought. It consists of sensible rather than intelligible differences. Thus, it is a category. Bergson's favorite example is the unfolding of a melody. Any difference in the duration of any part of the melody alters the quality of the whole because the relation between parts and whole changes unceasingly as a function of the difference between past and present. Thus, difference in quality varies continually as a function of duration and cannot be tied to the specifiable difference between two discreetly individuated states. 
but it falls into this qualitative difference um, can only be subjectively registered. To say that duration is lived, VQ as Bergson does, is to say that the subjectivity of duration is one with the subjectivity of sensation. Bergson then wishes to dissociate differences in sensation from differences in the representation of sensation. But to do this, he must dissociate our ability to discriminate qualitative differences from our ability to perceive qualities as properties of things, that is to say, enduring substances. Now, while the ability to discriminate sensory inputs is constitutive of sentience, the capacity to perceive something as something is a conceptual ability that marks the transit or the kind of the, uh, the fundamental distinction between uh, sentience and sapience, or the difference between feeling and knowing. In this regard, the distinction between substance and attribute which, of course, Bergson wants to kind of uh, uh, excise from his whole kind of uh, accounts of the experience of duration, can be taken to be the reflexive formalization of the pre-reflexive discrimination between thing and property implicit in our practical comportment or handling of things. And for many philosophers, Kant and Hegel foremost among them, this conceptualization of sensory discrimination signals the ascent from sensation to perception and marks a decisive step forward in our cognitive evolution. But for Bergson, conceptualization is metaphysically discredited precisely by its utilitarian origins. The intellect selects, abstracts, and generalizes, but these operations are determined by the needs, you know, the vital needs of the organism. Experience is perception, but because our perception is limited, our organs invariably subtract, select, and isolate elements from the flux of sensation. This is the uh, second quote. Um, if the senses and consciousness had an unlimited scope, if in the double direction of matter and mind the faculty of perceiving was indefinite, one would not need to conceive any more than to reason. Conceiving is a makeshift when perception is not granted to us, and reasoning is done in order to fill up the gaps of perception or to extend its scope. So, if then, on Bergson's account, conception traduces the metamorphic movement of duration. This is because it is called upon to supplement the organic limitations of perception. This is why intellection for Bergson fixes and abstracts, selects and subtracts. It arrests the flow of duration, carving it into discrete states to which it then attributes determinate properties. Intellection abstracts generic properties from these determinate states by subtracting their particular differences. And lastly, it uses these generic properties to establish relations of similarity and dissimilarity between states in terms of measurable changes in quality. By way of contrast, what Bergson calls intuition is nothing but pure perception, without selection or subtraction. So it follows in that for Bergson, the reality of change can only be intuitive and not conceived. But what qualities of duration does intuition reveal? Since these qualities are not attributable to recognizable things, how are we to say what they are qualities of? For Bergson, language and civilization more generally is precisely the medium of conceptual generality that substitutes the utilitarian representation of things for the presentation of duration as such. The conceptual specification of qualitative particularity remains constrained by the linguistic structure of categorization. For Bergson, it's precisely categorization 
that elides the absolute heterogeneity of durations qualitative singularities. Yet the intentionality of perception, the perception of something as something, as this and not that, seems to require conceptual mediation. By purging sensation of the intentionality of conception, Bergson rejects Kant's intrication of perception and judgment, the claim that all perception involves judgment, which is Kant's great claim. So Bergson absolutizes the heterogeneity of sensation to such an extent as to render its correlates indiscernible. Since in denying the ofness of sensation, or the object of sensation, he effectively and deliberately dissolves the distinction between sensing and sensed. But then the question remains, what is sensed? if any identification of the object of sensation is already its conceptual sequestration. The fusion of sensing and sense and intuition is not the perception of sheer heterogeneity, formlessness as such, but the substitution of conceptual indeterminacy for the phenomenon of formlessness. This is, this is ultimately to say that Bergson has to use language to communicate language's congenital inability <coughs> to capture the heterogeneity of a duration whose intrinsic features he can only ling indicate linguistically, which is to say conceptual. He has to resort to concepts to describe time's resistance to conceptual characterization. Okay, so now... We move to the, uh, the next section. So, Packy Bergson, time is not self presenting It does not show itself directly. There is no absolutely immediate experience of time as such, unfiltered by concepts. Once it's understood that time, in a sense, is mediation. Mediation is, of course, the fundamental category of dialectical thinking. And to say that time is mediation is to suggest that to think dialectically is to think temporary. Now, to understand how Jameson proposes to approach the phenomenon of time, we have to understand in what sense he's a self-consciously dialectical thinker who has choose both metaphysics and phenomenology. How can we mark this difference? Kant taught us to distinguish the formally necessary properties of our representations of things from the necessary properties of things in themselves. Metaphysics for Kant is dogmatic to the extent that it mistakes the properties of representations for the properties of things. It assumes that things in themselves simply lend themselves to representation. Dialectical thinking proposes to move beyond both the dogmatic representation of the thing itself and the epistemic formalism of Kant's critical philosophy with the claim that what Kant characterized as the discrepancy between representation and thing is in fact the thing itself insofar as it is no longer a self-identical substance but rather a concatenation of differences something that is not what it is and is what it is not. If, if one takes contradiction to be constitutive of, of, of the identity of sense. And most importantly for dialectics, the difference between what the thing is and what we take it to be is internal to the thing itself. If time then is the ultimate source of differentiation, this means that dialectics thinks time as both the form and the content of the thing. It lets things appear in time while letting time show itself in things. The problem then is to understand how time can resist encapsulation within prefabricated concepts without transcending conceptualization entirely. What is to be resisted is the theological gesture that would relegate time's formlessness to the realm of the utterly ineffable or the infinitely other. 
The challenge is to forge a form appropriate to the phenomenon of time as a new kind of phenomenon, such that time impregnates the knowing of time. And this is to make formlessness appear. But to phenomenalize formlessness is not to stamp it with the seal of unity, because time is not one. This is, and this is the quote from, uh, from Jameson. Okay. Um, Only in the intersection of multiple kinds of temporality can time itself, if one can speak of such a thing, be made to appear. The challenge then is to think time's heterogeneity, or better, its radical inconsistency, without subjectivizing it in such a way that this inconsistency is relativized to the empirical multiplicity of subjectivities. Now, Jameson credits Heidegger with a decisive conceptual innovation as far as the thinking of time is concerned. <coughs> time is not a phenomenon, but the phenomenality of the phenomenon. It is not appearance, but the appearing of appearance. Or what Jake or you know, Heidegger, Heidegger kind of simply says the Greek word for appearance, the phanestia. Time as phanestia shifts the register of analysis from the metaphysics of presence to the destruction of traditional ontology that overturns time's subordination to presence. This is, of course, Heidegger's task uh, in being in time, the destruction of traditional ontology which identifies being with being present and, and with substantiality. But in Heidegger, this overturning operates by invoking another type of transcendence. The transcendence of Dasein as that being which is, in each case, mind. So that, as Heidegger writes in his 1924 lecture, The Concept of Time, which is a kind of a, an encapsulation of the project of being in time and such, Heidegger writes, what is time became the question, who is time? More closely, are we ourselves time? Or closer still, am I my time? Um, the problem is that Heidegger shows that you can't, metaphysics cannot but um, elide the, uh, the phenomenon of time insofar as it hypostatizes, it reifies, it represents it. But the, um, you know, the displacement of this reification this representational uh, reification of time involves identifying time with um, the phenomenon of mindness, what Heidegger calls you know, existence as that being which is in each case mind. And notice the movement is that for Heidegger the radicalization of the question of time is a, is a, is a question of appropriation. You get closer and closer. The way to think time radically is to, is to make it closer and closer. So, and this kind of um, movement of appropriation um, is actually, Jameson, I think, rightly detects, is, is kind of the, uh, the weakness of, uh, or the, actually the, 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 uh, the unstated presupposition of, uh, of Heidegger's whole account. And of course, it's you know, criticized by Derrida. Um, um, so Heidegger's overturning of, of the metaphysics of presence is carried out in the name of a metaphysics of propriety, or ownership, authenticity, eigentlichkeit, which Jameson rejects precisely because it reinscribes the manifold of time, its formlessness, within the form of mindness or propriety. Thus Jameson wants to expropriate phanastia from the hermeneutics of propriety and use it to make formlessness appear. And this is the problem of figuring time. Um, um, figuration, in Jameson's account, is non-representational form. And Jameson draws on Ricoeur's account of time and narrative. Ricoeur proposes a hermeneutical turn to Heidegger's metaphysics of propriety, insisting that no, as Rieger himself says this, no pure phenomenology of time is possible. For Rieger, 
times appearing is not a date of intuition, as it is in Burton, nor resoluteness towards death, as it is in Heidegger, but rather the result of a narrative configuration. Configuration is a form of narrative synthesis. And as Ricoeur writes in Time and Narrative, the configurating act presiding over embodiment is a generative act involving a grasping together. Uh, configuration is a kind of a new kind of synthesis. Um, this narrative configuration or embodiment has three aspects that Ricoeur appropriates from Aristotle's poetics. Peripatia or reversal, uh, anagnoresis or recognition, and pathos or suffering. Now, literary narrative for Ricoeur exemplifies the configuration of time as the co-imbrication of reversal, recognition, and suffering in what Ricoeur calls a dissonant concordance free from the implausible resolutions of teleological synthesis, whether metaphysical or dialectical. Ricoeur's humanist agenda is clear. Narrative configuration gives shape to time beyond the fetishization of absolute heterogeneity, Averson, but also without reinstating historical teleology, as Hegel and Marx do, according to, to Ricoeur. The problem for Jameson is that this configuration of time as dissonant concordance replaces Heidegger's martial individualism of being towards death with intersubjective consensus and a benign pluralism. The implotment of dissonance, what Ricoeur calls the implotment, the narrativization of dissonance, subordinates time to the form of intersubjectivity, which precludes <coughs> catastrophic overturning, whose figures are the irreversible, the unrecognizable, the intolerable. Yet catastrophe is precisely one of the figures in which history appears, as the violation of the personal by the impersonal. And Jameson is quick to affirm the dialectical corollary of this claim, which is precisely what distinguishes historical materialism from tragic pessimism. History also appears as liberation as the emancipation of persons through impersonal institutions. And this is a long quote from, um, from, uh, from Jameson, which um, I'm going to read. Um, in the phenomenon that interests, us, that interests us here, the sudden flash of history, we must somehow account for the evidence that history, in that sense, can be experienced either as a nightmare or as a sudden opening and possibility that is lived in enthusiasm. Uh, he cites Kant's uh, uh, accounts of the, uh, the French Revolution, the, the, the enthusiasm solicited in rational beings by the French Revolution. Um, it is an alternation which suggests the existence of some deeper duality in the thing itself. The way in which, for example, the appearing of history, its fanestia, entails a new opening up of past and future alike, which can conceivably be marked antithetically. A somber past of violence and slaughter giving way to a new sense of collective production, or on the contrary, a glimpse of promise in the past which is shut down by a closing of horizons and universal catastrophe. Better still, both dimensions can be experienced at one and the, and the same time in an undecidable situation in which the re-emergence of history is unrelated to its content and dependent above all on that form in which after a long reduction to the lowered visibility of the present, past and future once again open up in the full transparency of their distances. So, this indissociability of ruin and accomplishment, of defeat and victory, beyond the reversals of narrative, for Jameson is, is but one symptom of a deeper duality in the thing itself, a fission which resists judicative synthesis, 
and exceeds narrative configuration, but reveals history as a totalization in process. And this is a realization that Jameson attributes to Sartre. History itself only appears within history, or to quote Jameson, it is only on the occasion of certain of its events that history can be grasped as an event in its own right. Thus, history is neither an all-encompassing continuity nor a punctual interruption, but the interpenetration of the two. And more importantly for Jameson, it's not consciousness or narrative whose synthesizing acts make history appear. The synthesizing power that gives form to the formless multiplicity of temporalities, drawing them all into its orbit, is not subjectivity but capital as motor of globalization. Capital is the totalization in process of history as synthesis of subjective and objective time. And this allows Jameson to re-articulate our initial triad. Subjective time, historical time, objective time. Jameson counters Ricoeur's idealist phenestia with a materialist alternative in which it is the capitalist mode of production that makes both time and history appear. In our initial triad, historical time was sandwiched between subjectivity and objectivity such that the philosophy of history pitted metaphysicians who subordinate historical change to natural becoming against phenomenologists who subordinate collective transformation to existential conversion. Jameson's great insight is that the difference between time and history must be made to appear within each term of the distinction. To think the difference between time and history is to historicize time and to temporalize history. History becomes the mediation and process through which both subjectivization and objectivization become possible. It mediates the transition from the pre-experiential to the experiential, from objectivity to subjectivity, just as it mediates the eruption of the impersonal into the personal, and the reinsertion of the personal within the impersonal. Uh, so that's the uh, that's how <coughs> Jameson rearticulates the triad with which we began. History of totalization in process is the condition for both subjective time and objective time. Um, okay, I'll just just five minutes now. Um, however. As a Marxist, Jameson cannot remain content with identifying capital as the motor of historical totalization. Capital is not the pilot of universal history, even if it is its engine. Because history is a totalization in process, rather than an achieved totality, it is necessarily incomplete. Thus, for Jameson, it implies its own other, both as what it is not, and as what it has never been. What is not and has never been is the reservoir of formlessness from which every figuration of time is drawn, but a formlessness devoid of potentiality, since potentiality is already endowed with conceptual form. What is not nor has ever been is nowhere and nowhere. And of course, it's utopia, as what Jameson calls the absolute negation of that fully realized absolute which our own system has attained. Utopia can only be figured for Jameson as the absolute other of systemic totality and totalizing event, as the other of substance and subject, or as he puts it, the alternate world contiguous with ours, but without any connection or access to it. This alternate world is already actual, rather than merely possible, yet its causal disconnection from ours renders it inaccessible. 
And in a justly famous passage, Jameson concludes, this is the final quote, then, from time to time, like a diseased eyeball in which disturbing flashes of light are perceived, or like those baroque sunbursts in which rays from another world suddenly break into this one, we are reminded that utopia exists and that other systems, other spaces, are still possible. There are two things, to, there are two things worthy of note here. First, James, Jameson subjects Heidegger's ontologization of possibility as finite transcendence, of Dasein, to a dialectical reversal. It is now the existence, which is to say the non-objective actuality of utopia, that is the condition of historical possibility as such. But the question is, what is the precise nature of this possibility? Second, it is the causal disconnection between contiguous worlds that renders them mutually inaccessible. But the, but the evocation of flashes of light registering in a diseased and presumably unseeing eye seems to imply some sort of transmissibility across disconnected worlds. Is this transmission causal, such that establishing trans-world access is a matter of forging new kinds of causality? Um, and if so, does this entail that possibility is to be understood in terms of these new forms of causal interaction across disjoint systems? The key thing, I think, to note is that in James and the the difference between actuality and potentiality is not ontological but epistemological. So that actuality is indexically defined. And this is actually, it's, it's very noticeable that Jameson invokes uh, contemporary, you know, science fiction obviously, but also contemporary physics and the, the multiverse hypothesis, where you have a kind of infinity of adjacent but uh, causally disconnected universes, okay? all of which are equally actual. And um, if actuality is indexically defined, the difference between actuality and, and possibility is a function of situatedness, of localization. The actual world is just this world where this is like, you know, indexically defined, which is to say it's cognitively accessible to us. But other currently inaccessible worlds are equally actual. Um, um, finally, utopia for Jameson can never be a representation but an operation that exposes the limits of what is currently conceivable. It has no content other than its negation of extant conceptual forms. But this absolute negativity is its actual content. So the final suggestion seems to be that the challenge is to, um, to rethink possibility in terms of uh, new modes of transmission um, from the uh, from that which is currently uh, Un, you know, unformula, unimaginable, which is the unformalizable, to uh, that which um, look, so it's, it's simply about forcing a, uh, a transformation in the structure of formalization. Um, okay, I'll stop. I've gone on. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs>
afraid, you know, I'm ill-equipped to answer. I don't know Lukash well enough to really, you know, um, articulate, you know, the difference, the fundamental divergence between James and the Lukash's account. So I have to plead, you know, I just don't know enough about Lukash to answer that question properly. Um, it seems, I mean, but maybe then on this question, yeah. the account of um, capital as a totalization of the temporal horizons, let's say, um, to which extent is other elements of practice involved in, in, in the interruption of these totalizing horizons? Okay. Um, There would have to be, I mean, you know, he doesn't say anything about it, but precisely because he thinks, I mean, it's, if utopia is an operation, not a representation, this operation is going to be both um, you know, theoretical and practical. So in other words, he thinks that um, the The attempt, to, to, the attempt to expose that which is um, occluded by this totalization process, or, or rather, which is to say, if you identify the point at which totalization um, deliberately presents itself as achieved, as accomplished, okay, then you can point out this gap, this mismatch between um, what is actual and what is possible. In other words, you can mark the difference between what is currently knowable, conceivable, practically achievable, and what might be what we can't imagine, what we can't think or conceive, or even you know conceivably transform. You can mark that difference, and then I think the suggestion seems to be that, that once you can mark that, you can point out the kind of, uh, you can identify the point of blockage and you know, force it, I think. Um, that's not a very, it's a negative operation. In other words, you, you point out that because totality, totalization is incomplete, the closure of the system. The idea that, that, that capitalism is a successfully a kind of self-imposed time, that's an illusion. That's one of its necessary trans that's the, that's the, the illusion represented by, by capital's own self-representation. Once you refuse to accept the terms of this capital's own representation of itself, then you can mark the discrepancy between um, totalization and totality. And you can identify points of um, inconsistency. Uh, now, that doesn't, I mean, practically, that's not, a, I mean, that's not much of a practical prescription. Um, but I think he has the resources to develop. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and,
self-reading of the Tsukabitadas. Is this the same or? Well, first of all, he rejects, um, you know, I think he rejects the Alice Rosario reading. I mean, he doesn't accept the kind of the structuralist accounts, the structuralist reading of Marx. Um, and there's various points, actually, where he kind of criticizes the, uh, the theory of over-determination, of causal over-determination, and of um, um, structural causality. Okay? So he, he rejects you know, key features of the Alice Rosarian account. Um, but the claim seems to be that the emergence of um, is the material um, determinant for the um, this total and this process of totalization. It's the integrating factor. It's the it, it's a factor that integrates um, these multiple temporalities, these multiple histories, into a single history. It, it forces, obviously, like it's it's an act, and it, it's kind of a through you know, colonialization, etc., etc., with all the kind of you know the unpleasantnesses that everyone knows about. Um, so history, as a kind of uh, he, he wants to say that history has a material kind of condition because the ability, because history is not a data. There is no such thing as history. It's not a phenomenon. Um, it is an experience that is conditioned by a certain, um, by a mode of production. And the way in which that mode of production simply kind of uh, you know, coordinates all social relations, all relations between humans and humans and between humans and non-humans. That's the claim, I think. So you've got the mode of production, Okay, then you've got history as totalization in process, and then you've got the uh, subjectivization or ob objectivization. Um, so, um, I mean, were you asking more about how exactly this? So it's not. So it's not a static. You don't have the static distinction between infrastructure and superstructure, um, because. The determination, there is no kind of, there's no structural causality. Okay, the mode of production doesn't kind of simply um, underwrite these super, superstructural effects in this static kind of way. Um, but, I mean, again, I can't, you know, I need to know more about kind of Jameson's. Uh, the specifics of Jameson's critique of Alto Zero to elaborate. Um, but then there's the second part of your question I didn't answer. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's... Could you speak all yeah. the mic? Because... Um, uh, yeah, if he considers this totalizing history as the mode of production, if he forget the uh, act you said. Uh, no, it's not. It's not, because, no, it's, he's not saying there's a difference between mode of production and history. Okay. So the claim is that we can only begin what we call history is retroactively determined by the, re the way in which we can conceive and imagine things in the current, in the current capitalist conjuncture. Um, that's the claim. The claim is that there's no such thing. History can't simply be kind of it's not a set of objective data okay, that can be represented. Um, it's in order for you to be, you know, um, history is only something that can be made to appear, but the condition of its appearing, both, you know, cognitively, both, you know, at the conceptual level, but also at the experiential level, he, he thinks is determined by the capitalist mode of production. In other words, the capitalist mode of production that determines the conditions of your experience, everything that you experience is determined by the capitalist mode of production, but also everything that you um, can conceive and imagine is also indirect, okay, in, a, in a more, in a less kind of saturated way, it's, it's kind of mediated by this. Um, but the key thing is that it's an open, it's a totalization in process. This is why Time, there's a time that's internal to 
capitalism as well. It's not, capitalism is not an achieved totality. It's, a, it's something that's in process, um, which is why it's an unstable, it's an incomplete phenomenon. So this is why he wants to avoid the claim that you know, the obvious rejoinder would be, well, how, how can you think outside this absolute, this all-encompassing you know, uh, system? <coughs> so, well, it's not. It's not all-encompassing. Um, even though it's, um, it's not all-encompassing because, because of time. Because time is both, it propels it, okay? Time is both what, what propels it, what drives it on, but prevents it from ever kind of uh, satisfying its own, um, its own compulsions, the, the kind of the, the mechanisms that drive it forward. Um, which is why I think he thinks that capitalism, well, there's going to be people talking about this a lot, but changes, fundamentally uh, reconfigures time, changes the way in which time is experienced. 